I'm, I'm deeply honored to have a chance to speak with you today. I'd like to thank uh, Yuzuri Hassan and, and Hori San for all, all the arrangements uh, on my behalf. Uh, thank you for your time and, and interest today. Uh, this is exciting that we're actually uh, taking this outside this room <coughs> to a new or uh, other venues, and I guess actually other countries. Uh, with Media Center, as I'll explain very shortly, we try to do the same thing. Uh, with some of our live streams and certainly uh, with the utilization of our stories. Uh, as, as was mentioned in the introduction, many, many moons ago, about 20 years ago, I live, uh, lived, I worked in this neighborhood over uh, near, uh, gosh, our, our Knight Ritter office was right near, uh, well, not too far from the British Embassy and I think closest to the Israeli Embassy. Uh, so uh, it brought back uh, some memories coming over today. But anyway, what I'm going to, to begin today's discussion on, as you can see, medium as the message. I work f for a, a corporation now. I, I guess I worked for a corporation when I was at Reuters, but we saw ourselves as a kind of an independent media without bias, uh, without influence, uh, and having the liberty, in most cases, to report and, and tell the stories uh, as we saw them. And, and thought that they would be the most interesting. Coming over to Nissan, that brief is, is not as wide. Uh, what I'm engaged in now, and, and I'll go into in greater depth, is what uh, some of our executives, Mr. Shiga in particular, call kotozukuri, basically telling your own story, a brand narrative, and finding exciting and the most technologically sophisticated ways to bring that content uh, to an audience, potentially of consumers. So uh, by way of background, uh, as the introduction said, I joined t literally on April 1st, 2011. Uh, it was a very, very busy time for Japan, uh, coming out of the great uh, uh, earthquake in Tohoku. Uh, and we'll talk a bit about that as it became part of the narrative uh, in 2011. But I think some of the key issues to understand what has been going on, gosh, if I can do this better, there we go, uh, is, well, the media has been around for a long time. You know, this is, I think, an old Japanese newspaper. I tried to find one. Uh, it might have been a, uh, uh, one of the first versions uh, of the Yomiuri or something in that vein. Uh, but publications have existed for people to pay uh, to receive information. And that kind of exchange is obvious uh, by going to a newsstand and giving 130 yen and getting your newspaper. But things became more sophisticated and they realized that within those pages they could actually place advertisements uh, and sell companies or or ideas that wanted, wanted to get greater exposure uh, and make more profit than just subscriptions or uh, stand sales. And so media very quickly came upon the idea of its relationship with corporations who obviously would become, oops, would become its advertisers. Uh, and as you can look back, uh, not too far in the past, 20th century advertising, for the most part, was centered in newspapers, magazines, radio, and then with the proliferation of television, uh, pretty much from the 1960s, uh, it, it gravitated reasonably quickly to, to broadcast. Then, as you I'm sure well aware, uh, obviously cable television expanded uh, and diluted the, the initial uh, avenues for uh, that advertising, but you know, primarily it had been focused in in the kind of traditional 20th century ways and and locations for where people would pay uh, to to advertise. Certainly, with the internet development, that's changed tremendously, and it's it's changed in ways that have deeply affected the media themselves. Uh, you know, if you look back and think that. Newspapers, once, you know, still pretty healthy here in Japan, but that's about the only place. In the United States, they're going bankrupt if they haven't come up with a, a global platform. 
uh, meaning I should say an internet platform delivery mechanism or firewalls, and this is everybody. These are the greatest newspapers of, of the 20th century. The Washington Post, for example, losing $300 million a year. So very quickly, the internet has, has affected media even more and the resources that are available to tell stories. And, and I, what I mean by that is, say for example, here in Japan, in the 1980s, most global newspapers could have a correspondent or at least a stringer in Japan. The numbers are almost negligible now, and mostly it's just stringer networks. There are bureaus, but they're almost prohibitively expensive uh, to, uh, to run, and those that, that do run them have responsibilities for the rest of Asia as well. You, in, in short, the Japan story in and of itself is not something, even with the proliferation of media, that companies in the United States or Europe or wherever will pay for now. Um, it's, it's quite a contradiction because you would think in the internet age, more news would be uh, desired, but actually people's willingness to pay for that news has gone down substantially. So just a, a quick breakdown, in 1995, 91% of U.S. firms were in newspapers, only 10% on the net. 2011, last year, this is an uh, advertising agency, WPP, they put ad spend at $497 billion, digital's now at $85 billion. Oops, I really haven't mastered this. Okay, so the internet age has dawned, and what's it gonna mean for everybody? Well, information's gonna be faster, it's going to be more widespread, and who you're going to trust, or whom you can trust, uh, is going to be even narrower, because as we're seeing in this current environment, pretty much anybody, citizen journalists, bloggers, it's all kind of running into the same uh, outlet. Now, I'm not really going to focus on that too much today, but you could kind of say, in telling your own story, you're actually becoming one of the media or one of these citizen journalists, if you will. Traditional media, as I was saying, uh, has, has been hit extremely hard. The, sp the, ex the spend on things like bringing you the news on TV, even, uh, is also less. Um, companies themselves, and this is really getting back to Nita Nissan, companies themselves are trying to, they're really examining how they've spent money in the past and seeing whether they're getting a commensurate bang for the buck, whether their brand can, is being elevated by the traditional ways they were communicating or marketing themselves. And I think really what, what I'm gonna to speak to shortly is that the media center or this concept of your own brand narrative or telling your own story uh, is seen from a return on investment perspective uh, as, as far more uh, advantageous. Along with this, and you know, perhaps we're speaking, uh, you know, we're streaming somewhere right now. Uh, in my own company, we use Ustream uh, as a way to get out. We tweet everything we do. Uh, we basically, and everything ends up on Facebook as well as our platforms. We really see the potential for the lifting to be done by others. And when I say lifting, if you've got a good story, if you've got a good video, if you've got a good um, you know, picture, letting other people spread that via social media is, is I think, a very easy strategy and it, it has far greater uh, dissemination than if you, you tried or orchestrated it yourself. And certainly that's also a factor in where corporates are putting their money now uh, and probably will we'll grow even further ahead. Okay. So uh, these are two banners from our, our corporate homepage. Uh, one with Mr. Gohn, the CEO of the company, and the other on a trip I took last week to uh, Osaka where we were, uh, we were part of a, a joint effort with the government, the city government of Osaka and the prefectural government 
to promote something called uh, Leaf to Home, which is basically taking a, a, an electric vehicle, the Leaf, uh, and, you, and donating those so that, be they uh, related to the government or not, uh, you could charge your battery at night at lower electricity rates and then run them uh, or, or use that, that in the next day where rates are much higher. And this potentially is a way uh, Osaka and other places, because of tight power supplies right now, uh, are, are uh, looking at, at kind of new strategies. But anyway, it, it, it's a story that we're involved in and one that we need to tell in real time, which we did. But anyway, coming to some of the things that, you know, the strategies behind uh, why a media center, I think um, one of the most obvious is the 20th century way, if you had an event, if you had financial results, if you were marketing a new car, here's our new, or you're marketing a, a new ATM uh, interest rate, or who knows what, you would send a press release. And quite frankly, having worked at the media, I can say pretty much nobody reads press releases in the media. Maybe the sentence, maybe the first sentence or two, but all of that other information is, is generally uh, not acted upon unless the media is particularly lazy. You know, more, more than not, Press releases are read one time. If you send things, though, via video, if you tell the same story in a video that's done a little bit more uh, cleverly, the potential for sharing is there. And again, what I'm saying is have your audience do your work, do your lifting. If you've made something cool, get it out there, and then wait for people to, to help you disseminate it to a, to a larger group. Uh, as I mentioned, we, we use Ustream right now. Uh, it's certainly, this is not something that's new to uh, media. Media is increasingly getting away from paying for satellite costs that are too uh, appreciably high, uh, prohibitively high. Uh, but it, it's actually so cheap and easy to do from anywhere that, you know, we were in France in, uh, in, early, in June for the Le Mans, and we were streaming everything from there to a global audience. Uh, obviously, there are still issues of you know, uh, who owns rights and whatnot, and you have to navigate those. But literally, we streamed everything from Osaka. If we were here today, we'd be streaming everything from here. Uh, and that's really what the 21st century allows us to do in a way that you know, then you stream, and then you have a, a Twitter feed running next to your, your uh, video so that when we bring financial results from Yokohama, we, we run them, uh, well, an English version, a Japanese version, and a, twi uh, a, a Twitter stream right next to it. These are all ways potentially of engaging more people into the discussion, but really, uh, you know, I, I think we're still at the earliest stages of sophistication in, in how this is done, uh, and it'll probably get even, you know, more involved uh, and, and, and in more interesting. The basic end game, though, of this was that <clears throat> when I came in, the brief was, we want to elevate the brand. We want to take Nissan and Infiniti and now Datsun to a place and to an audience uh, that it hasn't gone before. And you know, our measuring this will be you know, more people potentially coming into showrooms and ultimately the ability to raise prices because demand is there. Um, there's also kind of an internal communications element to this, making sure that your own company's story is known or disseminated among your own staff. Nissan has globally about a quarter of a billion, uh, excuse me, quarter of a million people, 250,000 people working for it. Internal comms is generally pretty dry stuff. You know, company speaking to company staff and, you know, it, it doesn't, have legs often to go externally. You know, it almost you know, would be something that would be too arcane or, or, or too difficult to even try to mention outside. So really, with this, with the stories we make, we don't want it to be too Nissan only. We want it to have some outward, external looking uh, element to it. Very shortly, I'll show you 
uh, a video to kind of give you a better uh, understanding of, of what will or how we're doing this. But I, I think to just to come back for a second, I mentioned Koto Zukuri, but by, my brief when I started this team was to actually hire former journalists who have uh, what you would call a so what element uh, or charge. What do you think I mean by that? So what? Sure. Exactly. How many times, you know, you, a company can, can be too impressed with itself. Oh, you know, we've got a lovely CSR program and we want to tell you. So what? You know, it, this better be something special or you've wasted my minute and 30 seconds. And really, that's what we want to do is challenge ourselves, distill something that's more interesting, still, there's still something that is actually going to have an audience. It's not a going through the motions, we have to do that story. Unfortunately, we still do have to do those stories sometimes. And I'm not just saying CSR, because CSR, you're going to see one, can be quite interesting and I, I think compelling. But you cannot do them perfunctorily. You have to really think it through to what would the audience? We are in a era of incredibly short attention spans. The internet makes it that much easier. Nobody's locked into promising you two minutes of their time. So it better be interesting, and it better be interesting pretty fast. Uh, again, I, I think I've covered this in just how we deliver some of the stories. Uh, live streaming for financial results, for these events. Uh, as I was telling Horisan, we're, we're actually going to uh, begin uh, to do a weekly program and then a daily program. Probably won't be live initially, but eventually we want to have our own channel. Uh, if you've seen, uh, you know, YouTube, for example, has branded channels of certain corporates already. Um, you could find a Nissan channel there, but it has some, it's basically just a kind of a compendium of all the videos that we've made. And the way we look to do this, uh, again, via the internet, not, not via broadcasting, uh, is to start with a 15 to 30 minute program once a day and loop it so that it can be seen. And we, we are making enough videos or, or reports to, to support that uh, and support a longer loop. Uh, eventually, we may get in some situation where we take this program and we exchange it or we get it on a broadcaster that needs, needs content. And I should say specifically about this program that we don't want it to be about Nissan alone. We want it to be about the Asian automobile industry uh, and you know, the growth markets uh, of the industry are obviously uh, China, Indonesia, well, Russia, India, Brazil, but um, we need to tell, and we, we need to tell everybody's story, again, to pass the so what test, and I think to really give, give some street cred to the content we're creating. If it's solely yours, sometimes it can, it can feel a little like Pravda or KCNA, and we really want to avoid that. Okay, so um, as I mentioned, finally, the return on investment, and this is something you're gonna hear uh, in any kind of MBA type uh, case study or whatnot, but <clears throat> ultimately, Nissan did not spend too greatly to to, uh, to launch this project relative to its global advertising spend or, or mark, you know, what they call it, FMI. But we have a responsibility to show how that is, is returning what they put in. And, and some simple metrics are obviously your views, uh, your streams, uh, excuse me, your tweets and, and those kinds of things from social media but just cost alone. Uh, rough, roughly, if you were to make a 30-second 30 30 second advertisement, what do you think it would cost you in Japan using uh, age, advertising agencies? Yeah. 
that, that, that's pretty, that, that's high. But it depends on how sophisticated the respective commercials would be. But let, let's just say a ballpark figure for a low-end CM of 300,000 to 500,000 bucks. Now, it's not cheap, and, you know, but probably that's, that's on the lower end of spend. With our team, we don't charge anything beyond what we have. And as you're going to see, we make content that is as good as the agency or better, in my own not so humble opinion. But you know, the real point of this is I think the agencies are going to have some issues ahead because they're going to be seen as overpriced and, again, extremely short shelf life sometimes, a 30-second spot that's only going to run for a month. Is that worth millions of dollars? Is that worth a ha half million dollars? Perhaps not. Anyway, uh, the, I think I'm eventually going to go the right way. Uh, the Global Media Center, again, found its, its footing on April 1st, 2011. And for Nissan, let's say, for Japan, it was, a, it was still a period of crisis coming out of the, the, the earthquake and the tsunami and the nuclear disaster. Uh, and there was this sense, okay, so what's going to happen? Uh, how is recovery going to be you know, done? Uh, and what, what's at stake here? So all of those things aside, my job was to get a team in place, hired and on board reasonably quickly, uh, to be able to tell that recovery story. That was one of the many stories that we saw as obvious. So the earthquake, tsunami, and nuclear disaster are all basically from 311. But by the end of March, uh, Mr. Ghosn had gone back, to, had gone to Iwaki, the factory that we that Nissan has there. Iwaki in the, is in the southern part of Fukushima, if you don't know. Um, and it had been damaged to the point of shutdown. Logistics for all of Japan, uh, for, for the globe, had been bottlenecked. There was nothing going in and out of ports. It was an exporter's nightmare. Uh, but, you know, shoulder to the wall, uh, things were done uh, very, very speedily, and, and recovery began pretty much from April. As this is going on, uh, we were charged with getting a team on board, building a studio, and beginning to create content, these stories. Um, so I, I think I've probably skipped the most important, we would say buried the lead in media. What, so what does the media center do? I mean, are you still kind of doing what marketing comm did until it got a fancy name? Well, we hope, we hope to be sharing some of the same aims, but doing it in a different manner. Uh, and, and really the, the way or the focus of our stories have been the people, the products, the technologies and brand relationships that affect Nissan, Infiniti, Datsun, anybody uh, that, that is affiliated with us. And you know, it, it, it extends to those relationships could be places where we do business. They could be sponsorships we have. For example, Infiniti sponsors the Red Bull racing team. Uh, one of one of its sponsors, uh, and that gives us certain liberties to bring content uh, from F1 races. Last year, when Sebastian Vettel won uh, the championship at Suzuka, both the driving and the team championship was won. Actually, I didn't team championship didn't happen the following weekend, but he came to our studio. He visited, and um, it really was kind of you know we did an interview, we streamed it. We wanted to bring it in a way, you know, using or basically leveraging that relationship to tell a cool story that wasn't necessarily something that felt like from the mouth of marketing. Um, you know, obviously, I said we embraced social media very quickly. That certainly helped. In, in year two, our brief is to expand distribution of this content. Uh, and we're looking at a lot of different ways to do that, and, and some may actually involve paying for that, but uh, in hopes with Channel 23 that a lot of this may happen uh, of its own accord. Uh, and as I mentioned, launching a TV channel, uh, we'll be bringing uh, Roland Burke, who was the uh, Japan correspondent for the BBC, is going to be joining us 
uh, next week, Monday. Uh, and he will be executive producer for this new uh, TV uh, situation uh, or t TV bro uh, s s channel. Finally, just before we start some of the video content, and I'll, I'll come back, I'll speak to it individually. These were some of our top stories for last year. I, you know, I, I think hopefully we, when we mention or when you see some of the videos that are, pertain to Tohoku, you will find that we were not callous or uh, disrespectful in, in how we told those stories. You know, m kind of trying to market yourself off of human hardship uh, is not a bright strategy, nor is it appropriate. Uh, and I think the stories we did and were really based more on what was happening in those regions uh, and, and how or why people should be interested. Uh, we've done last year, if you may know, the EV, the Nissan LEAF, began its first full year of sales. So we, we were tracking the, ro the global rollout uh, of, of LEAF. Uh, it is now expanding in, in sales, and certainly more models are being added to the EV mix, uh, not only at Nissan, but at other automakers as well. Um, the other things we do, I mentioned Vettel. This was his visit to the Yokohama headquarters. Does anybody know who he is? The proud, you might want to call him the father of GTR, although I don't think that's fair. His name is Mizuno-san, and he is, uh, he is the basic uh, creative force behind uh, our GTR. Uh, and it is a car, it is a wonder car. Uh, it is as powerful uh, as the European uh, lines, but for about 80,000 bucks less, at least. Um, and GTR is obviously a halo product for, for Nissan, uh, as is the leaf above it. Does anyone recognize that? He kind of looks like the Batmobile. Nope. Okay. Well, our marketing and communications has not been effective enough to get the message here. But basically, this is called the Delta Wing. The Delta Wing was a, an experimental, it's called Garage 56, I think, car that was allowed to run at Le Mans. Le Mans is an endurance race, 24 hours long. And this funky Batmobile uh, was allowed to take part. Not out of pity or whatnot. The thing's fast. The thing was amazing. Uh, and the Japanese, there were three drivers. Uh, one driver is named Satoshi Motoyama. Another, uh, Michael Crum. If you know Kimiko Date, that's, that's her husband. Uh, and the other guy was Marino Franchitti. He, uh, he sounds Italian, but he's really Scottish. A little weird. Um, anyway, these three gentlemen were the drivers. Unfortunately, uh, during the race, Toyota, a Toyota popped the Batmobile. It went into a wall, and Motoyama tried valiantly to, to get the car back up and running, uh, but was unsuccessful. Nonetheless, we brought this story to the world in the middle of the night. Uh, we did stories and pictures and tweets, and this story that you, well, the, you'll see the video has been the most successful thing that we've ever done. Now, last, when the last I looked, about 530, 40,000 views. It's seven minutes long. You know, this is war and peace. It is, for TV or video, it's long. So, uh, it kind of is counterintuitive to what would be successful, but the story itself is quite compelling. So anyway, these are some of the things. I just wanted to say motorsports, it cannot be just dry things about you know, financial results or we did, it's got to be something that people will invest their time in and hopefully we will continue to make that kind of uh, content. All right, now I think we can go on to the videos if I can figure out how to do this. So the first thing you're going to see, and I, I won't, uh, you won't have to watch the entire version. This is a video that we made for uh, AGSM. AGSM. Do you know what? That's the annual general shareholder meeting. <clears throat> we had done a, a version of this uh, differently uh, for staff. 
but it kind of highlights, without words, uh, what we have been doing over the last year. Hopefully, probably turn down the lights just a little bit. And although you don't hear anything, you will shortly. I may have to go here. I think the audio is going to here. I probably won't need too much explanation of where this is, but this was all in kind of chronological order of the recovery. The musical track uh, is provided by The Who uh, without copyright. I hope that didn't feel too much like an infomercial, uh, but basically, just want to give you a taste of what went on over the last year. Uh, it is, that's not the way we normally tell our stories. That was very CM-esque, with just kind of rapid cuts, musical underlay, quick bits. But within that were, were all stories that we did over the last year, and can talk at greater length about you know, uh, some of those. Um, I believe the next one you're going to see, if things work out as planned. Hello. Nissan CEO Carlos Ghosn visited the quake hit factory town this of Milwaukee Tuesday, of calling the Fukushima plant's comeback a symbol of Japan's Milwaukee recovery. Factory had the factory saw broad structural recovery. damage in the devastating March 11th Tembler, which prompted other plants to rally to make up for lost Nissan and Infinity output. Nissan CEO announced in his second trip since the earthquake the adding of another workshop in Milwaukee, boosting production to 80% of pre quake levels and dovetailing with more suppliers coming online. The video of that walkabout that you're seeing right here. I'm today sending you a plan. As you know, you know the light is back. There's no problem of water. They are at 100% capacity restored. It doesn't mean that the plant is producing at 100% because we still have some problems with some suppliers, but... Okay, I, kind of a nice freeze there. 
no, I, what I, I guess what I'm trying to say is we really want to give the flavor of, you know, this is news. And if we, you know, we're not going to put it out Tuesday. Uh, the visit's on Monday morning. We want it out Monday, and we want it if any media need it for their evening program, it should be ready. And so we prepare it as a voiceover package, as we call it. Uh, we also give them raw footage if they want to do their own uh, anchors uh, voiceover version. You have to think about the audience. If you do something in English, are they going to want to listen to it in Hungary? No, probably not. So try to be as, uh, as considerate of a potential audience as you can. But again, in the same, same way I was saying, make sure the story has some flair, if possible. All right, we'll go to another story. This one, this one is, I think, the longest, not the longest video we've ever done, but this was a story specifically about uh, <clears throat> the recovery uh, from 311 uh, in, in Tohoku, but specifically related to Nissan. So this should be it. This was a series we did. We kind of call it the Heroes series, but basically at 2.46 in the afternoon of March 11, an unprecedented disaster struck Japan, claiming over 24,000 lives and threatening the safety and livelihoods of millions in the country. For Nissan, some five staff and 17 family members perished in the devastating 9.0 magnitude earthquake and tsunami with more than 50 dealerships and parts suppliers damaged as production across Japan shut down completely. The Yokohama headquarters, which felt the quake although 250 kilometers away, an earthquake crisis committee of executives met within minutes. But the magnitude of destruction and potential impact on Japan and Nissan had no blueprint. The response would test the resilience and imagination of company staff with heroes emerging to help lead Nissan, its many customers and stakeholders, to safer ground. For Miyagi branch manager Hiroyuki Santo, who lost two staff and was himself listed among missing after the tsunami struck, a slow evacuation from the disaster zone gave insight into how great its impact. その後抜けた後に道路行ってももうガラッキーいっぱいでもう車は当然走れる状態じゃなかったので、それが4日目か5日目だったと思うんですね。え、あと Okay, I'm going to stop, stop just at that, that moment. Uh, this is just a little bit more. One of the programs that we uh, contributed to was, uh, I think it was a world food program uh, in, in some relief efforts. But, you know, again, probably the hardest story that we've had to tell is, is doing that without seeming uh, cavalier about, you know, what was a, just, a, just a terrible, horrific disaster. Um, and, but the stories themselves, I mean, you know, just... When I, when I think about him calling and apologizing, you know, it, it still just cracks me up to, to, you know, to think that that was, that was the Japanese response to something so grave. So anyway, uh, on to the next video, uh, which, oh, let's get that going. And... <laughs> Nissan Leaf won Japan's Car of the Year Saturday, its fourth major accolade this year, and an important media recognition at the nation's major auto show. Chief Operating Officer Toshiyuki Shiga said the award the first by Japanese media since the early 1990s, 
was reflective of the hard work of Nissan staff and growing global consciousness about zero emission potential. I think uh, this is uh, the big challenge for Nissan to make uh, zero emission mobility society. And uh, this is as a first step. I am so glad. All right. Um, again, that was one of, I think, three or four awards it, it took last year. Um, the Tokyo Motor Show, did anyone go? No. OK, well, uh, it was kind of an interesting show. The industry as a, as a whole was kind of coming out of its uh, Lehman shock down, you know, extreme downside. Uh, it's probably not back to where it, it once was yet. But uh, you know, the industry, is a, uh, industry along with uh, Nissan uh, certainly uh, has been doing much better uh, this year. Uh, I think this is more, you saw a little of the leaf in Hokkaido, and this was a shoot we did in January. Auto journalists put the all-electric Nissan Leaf through its paces on three powdery test courses in Shibetsu, Hokkaido this week, in the freezing temperatures of northern Japan. Some 230 meters above sea level, media gathered to assess the Leaf's driving performance and handling in extreme weather conditions icing any concerns that wintry weather could drastically reduce battery performance. Chief Vehicle Engineer Hidetoshi Kadota said despite a reading of minus 9 degrees Celsius outside, the LEAF battery stayed between 5 and 10 degrees Celsius. In the more extreme cold of Canada and Norway, a battery warming system can keep the LEAF primed to charge at normal capacity, the same as outside temperatures of about 20 degrees Celsius. Okay, I, I should say in this video and some others that we've done about uh, EVs, I'll even go back to, to June or May, sometimes we're kind of speaking to what's out there in the social media world, the buzz, if you will. And there seem to be some concerns about leaf in cold, cons you know, cold environments. Uh, earlier, for Japan-related exports, there was in the in kind of the slightly panicky days of, of the Fukushima Daiichi accident, you know, are Japanese exports radiated or, are, you know, potentially going to be contaminated? And, and so we would do stories about the actual testing that was going in. I mean, obviously these are serving a corporate master, but, you know, for the other side of things, we, we you know, we feel that this is speaking to an audience that wants more information and hopefully uh, we would be credible uh, in supplying that to them. This is the last video clip I'll show you. And uh, lots of things going on. This was from something called Goodwood. This is not the one we produced, but one we ran. Again, when you hear music underneath, you usually expect somebody had... I can't believe it. Money. We've just gone and smashed at anything that I thought Goodwood we were going to do. I didn't believe that I could do under two minutes for a whole run up this hill. Weather's been good to us, uh, thank goodness. We've managed to, to do exactly what we wanted. We achieved at 1 minute 37. There's no way I thought we was going to achieve Backwards. that. The leaf apparently uh, has as much speed backwards as it does forward. Same it, it set the Guinness Book World Records in this. Obviously a little Luckily, camera Luckily, the leaf there. has got a low center of gravity. That saved my bacon a few times. I'm sure I was going to roll over. I haven't. I thought I was going to crash into the barriers. I didn't, thank goodness. Mind you, if I had a done, it's so robust, the leaf, it would have bounced back out and we would have carried on anyway. I can't believe the leaf can go as fast in reverse as it can in forwards. All you do is take the limiter off. In the end, he was successful, and I think that gives you the full explanation. Yeah, uh, set a world record, a minute and 36, something like that, up this hill. Um, well, that, that kind of brings me uh, to the transition towards the questions, and I, I just want to come back to a couple of things that I, I might have introduced but not, not fully fleshed out. With the changes in advertising, uh, towards media themselves. The media in Japan are considerably thinner and 
with less resources than they were 10 years ago or definitely 20 years ago. And they are looking, excuse me, for uh, any kind of assistance to make their storytelling easier as well. So one of the things that we, we are cognizant of is trying to give, you know, give video or give something to broadcasters that can help them do their own work independently if they don't want to use what we've created. And, and I'll give you one example. Oh yeah, thank you, you can go ahead. Um, we did a story on a, there's a, there's a vessel carrier that runs from Kyushu to, to Homoku in, in Kanagawa. And this vessel carrier actually has a, a, lot, a big tier of solar panels on, on it. It's basically like an echo, I think it's called the Echo Maru or something. But essentially we did this story, we interviewed the captain, the company that supplied the solar panels, etc. And the story was seen by CNN and they didn't wanna, they wanted to do their own version. So sometimes all, all we want to do is get the message out there, then other media, if they want to do their own version independently, which is certainly their prerogative, then we can set up or set them up uh, with, with the proper uh, contacts on our side. Uh, I, I think I gave you a, a real microcosm of, of w the work that we did last year. We did over, I, I mean, in fits and spurts, there are probably over 200, almost 300 videos in, in a little more than a year. Uh, the average, our page, what's the right word? Because of Le Mans, our, our daily viewership has just tripled. Uh, you know, it's all skewed, uh, but what happens is, if you have a successful video and you get people to your channel, they watch other things too, and everything goes up. So, uh, you could say, success can breed success, Failure won't breed success, but by doing, by, by bringing something that's really cool, sometimes then you can also bring, uh, bring an audience to content that is not necessarily of immediate interest to them. And that's something that's also a strategy that, that we're considering. Uh, we have a web page, uh, which if you haven't visited already, I, I encourage you to do. Uh, it's called Nissan Global. There's an English and a Japanese version. Uh, most of our, I'd say 70% uh, of our stories are also available with Japanese subtitles. Uh, we have launched in Chinese and Mandarin. Uh, so you can see on social platforms as well as Dongfeng Nissan platforms our content uh, in, in Mandarin. Uh, it's a very big audience for us uh, relative to uh, global numbers, literally by adding content in China, you can add a zero to your, your total uh, activation. The events that are going on for Nissan and the whole industry in China are exceptionally compelling right now. Uh, we just uh, had a groundbreaking for a plant in Dalian. Uh, I was in Beijing for the auto show in April, uh, but you know, constantly something, Nissan, excuse me, Infinity has located their global headquarters in Hong Kong. Uh, because of the importance of the Chinese market uh, to, to uh, our luxury brand. Um, another thing that's going on, you saw just a, trink, a, just a snippet of Datsun. Uh, Datsun has been relaunched. It was a very popular uh, global brand up until the, the early 80s. Many people in America, their first car was a Datsun. It won't be reintroduced, however, in the United States right now, but the countries where it's going to get its first wheels, literally, on the ground will be Indonesia, where we were, and that's where the announcement was made, Russia, uh, in, and India. Uh, and that, that will likely expand as well. We will be needing output or capacity to, to supply those cars, and that's in, in the works as well. Um, I think that starts to, to kind of get to you know the, the, the core of you know, really, if you were in any industry right now, what, who would you want to speak to the most? I think you'd want to speak to an emerging, a developing, they don't even like to use the word emerging anymore, a developing market where consumers may be buying their first anything, first car, first home, first television, and get them, uh, get them into the conversation and to consider you. Now, these are things, again, I, I, 
I can still consider myself a journalist, but I'm probably now talking like a sales guy. Um, and that, I guess, happens a, a, as part and parcel of thinking about the audience that we're, we're aiming a specific story towards. But a lot of times, you can do a lot of planning and you think you know uh, what works and what doesn't. The first story that we did that, that went uh, viral was a story about a racing car, not surprisingly, called the Leaf Nismo RC. And they were doing some testing in Chiba. Uh, and the car is an EV race car, uh, and it goes very fast. But it had, there's, no, there's no EV circuit. There's no kind of like Le Mans or like Super GT. There's nothing where it could kind of activate and be used. The speeds are still slower. But obviously, a zero emissions race car is, is a, a very uh, innovative and, and yet uh, untapped possibility. But actually, people are starting to think, and that was the deal with the, this car, is that it was 50% less of everything, 50% less energy consumption, 50%, you know, even motorsports are starting to realize that you know, muscle cars or just big and loud and, and, and smoky uh, is, is probably not a sustainable future. But this Nif, Ni, Nismo Leaf RC story, we, it was, I, the two guys went out there, it was a, a, a camera person, a producer, and, you know, when they came back, I said, I, yeah, I'm sure, just two minutes, three minutes, that's fine. Well, they made a story that was seven, over seven minutes long. All all in Japanese with English subtitles. And I thought, no one's going to watch this. You know, it's just not going to go anywhere. But because of its topicality, Top Gear, has anyone ever seen the BBC car show? Top Gear Im embedded that video, and obviously its views uh, spiraled. So I guess the, the bottom line, and hopefully the humbling element of this is, you know, I, I was a journalist for 17 years, and sometimes I don't know what's going to work uh, as a story or an idea, and it just it you know it just happens to be the right time and uh, alignment of the planets. Well, uh, almost time for questions. I, in summary, I guess the only thing to to point towards, and and perhaps this will uh, pre precipitate some questions or, or discussion, is so what do we do for year two? We want our volume of content is increasing. We do about a on average, a story a day, and again, in multiple languages. Uh, but we really want to take it to more languages. Uh, oddly, or I don't know, hopefully, uh, a kind of a harbinger of, of good things to come, there's a real demand to get this content in Spanish now, um, and probably Portuguese uh, as well, uh, because of the expansion that Nissan's making in Brazil, and, and certainly in Latin America, particularly Mexico, Nissan is quite strong. Um, but the other languages, certainly Mandarin was a no-brainer for us. Uh, Japanese, we will, will continue to produce. Um, and you know, while we're probably not going to get much larger, uh, uh, with the exception of, of the launching of the TV service, we are starting to put kind of satellite bureaus in places uh, to really make it a global news center, a global news team, uh, one in which wherever the story is and wherever hopefully something cool is going on that we can, they, we can bring that to an audience, uh, both external and internal. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to your questions. Thank you.